Okay guys, so this lecture is going to go over how multiple populations interact with one another um, in their environment, and that's called a community, um, as well as how those communities interact with one another um, and their environment, uh, and that's called an ecosystem. Um, so we're going to talk about a little bit in this lecture, um, what are some of the evolutionary forces that drive communities, um, how in species interact with one another in communities, what drives uh, animals to come and go from communities, um, and some of the big major players on how animals interact with their ecosystem and some of the things from the ecosystems um, that can impact the animals and how all those things are interconnected. So first off, let's start about talking with what a community is. <clears throat> so if you recall, a population um, from our previous lecture is a group of animals that are all the same species um, that are capable of interacting with one another and interbreeding with one another to produce fertile offspring. And that's our key definition of what a population is. So a community um, are more than one population of animals interacting with one another. Um, so that's the thing. So you, every single living organism in that entire area, um, whatever it happens to be, it could be a park, it could be a, a whole natural uh, forest, um, a whole natural uh, um, uh, national park, something like that, or just a community park or um, a desert or things like that. It could be as big or as small as you want to define it. Um, but any living animal, um, any living organism, plant or animal, um, bacteria, fungus, and things like that, any living biotic, that's the uh, biological term here for living organisms, biotic, any living organism um, is going to be counted within that community as well. Um, so anything that's alive is going to count in the community. So all of the individual populations of organisms within that given uh, ecosystem, all of their populations um, added together are going to make up the community um, of organisms that live within that ecosystem. So if you take all of the different communities um, in that area, all the communities in that entire little, eco, uh, little environment, you get an ecosystem um, when you add in the non-living part of that um, ecosystem. So a community is only going to include the living portion, uh, things like plants and trees and uh, animals and birds and things, um, whereas an ecosystem is going to include all of the communities plus the non-living factors um, as well. So animals impact one another, uh, they eat each other from time to time, they prey upon one another, um, they may come in and knock over somebody's nest or uh, um, trample somebody's territory or compete for food and things like that. But the ecosystem, the non-living part, the abiotic portion of the environment, also plays a large role on how animals are going to evolve and where they're going to live and how big their populations can get as well. So you have to take that into account as well. Um, when you study how these ecosystems and how these communities and things are all interconnected. Um, things like the amount of sunlight that comes into an area, um, things like the amount of water or the uh, pH of that water or the clarity of the water or uh, the amount of minerals that are available and things like that. The non-living factors um, also influence um, the animal and uh, other organisms that live in that in area. So one of the main things that we're going to start with um, are living organisms within that community. So we'll start with communities and then build up to our ecosystem. Um, so within communities of animals, um, in a population you have to fight with your own species, and that makes sense. Um, you're going to have to compete with your own species for food, and you're going to have to compete with your own species for mates and things like that. But that's not a huge deal in the sense of evolution uh, because of the kind of the end goal is your own species continues, and that's kind of the game. Um, so as long as there's a net increase in the species as a whole, um, you are kind of fulfilling the uh, evolutionary purpose of life, um, so there's not a lot of ch uh, evolutionary pressure to change. Well, competition among your own species is, is a, not a great thing, but it's to be expected. But competition between other species is a big deal. Uh, when you live in a community of other organisms, um, other species, you have to compete with those other organisms um, for the same limited resources that you need as well. Um, if you live in an environment like uh, up here with our um, griffin vultures and our jackal down here in Africa, um, they are both scavengers. They both rely on carrying for their food, um, dead animals that other animals have uh, killed um, and they steal their prey, or animals that have just died of natural causes. 
So there's only so much carrion to go around in the African plains. There's lots of things that eat carrion and not just these two animals, hyenas, other lions and things like that would love to find a free meal. Um, so you have to not compete only with the other jackals in the area, um, but all of the other animals in your area um, that are going to try to steal that food that are going to try to use up those limited resources as well. Um, so that's a bad thing um, when it comes to this. Competing with your own species is one thing, but competing with another or multiple species um, for the same resources is a big deal. Um, so this is kind of one of the main factors for driving animals again out of the previous environment that they uh, habitat that they uh, inhabit. Um, when you have to fight too much for food, it's just not worth it. Um, so go find something else to eat, go find somewhere else to live that you can find that there's not a lot of people or, or different organisms fighting with you there um, and evolve to adapt and adapt to fit that environment better um, than anyone else. So that's kind of one of the ways that uh, evolution is driven, this competition. The more animals that are there to compete with you um, in the ecosystem that you inhabit, um, the more likely it is um, to push you away um, from the environment that you're in. Now, how do organisms keep this thing from happening? Uh, keep this competition, reduce this. Competition is a bad thing. If I have to fight as a jackal for, with this vulture for food, um, I could be injured. Um, I'm not going to get as much energy as I could uh, just going to eat because I'm going to have to fight for it. I may lose, which means I've just spent a bunch of energy trying to fight off this vulture for nothing. Um, he could kill me, which is a net lose. Um, or the other way around, this vulture could lose and be eaten and killed and things like that. So both of these organisms are losing when they have to fight for their food. Um, whereas if they just didn't have to fight for their food, um, both of them would come to a net win. Uh, free food for everyone. So how do organisms keep this kind of concept from happening? Well, organisms evolve to fit different niches. Um, and I think I previously talked about this a little bit on one of our earlier lecture sessions about different types of little habitats in an environment, little micro habitats and things like that. Um, inside of the uh, a tree or something, there's going to be more sunlight at the top, less sunlight at the bottom. Um, it's going to be cooler on the inside of the tree than it is on the outside of the tree, farther away from the trunk, um, and things like that. So there's different little habitats within um, a seemingly the same uh, environment. Um, so those are called niches, those different tiny little environments within um, the habitats. So if you occupy, if you evolve to fit um, a very uh, distinct niche that not a lot of other organisms are in, um, say you're the only organism um, that eats, uh, that lives on the inside of the tree trunk, um, that eats this one little piece of dripping sap that comes out, um, and that's the only species that does that, you have a food source that's just for you. Um, but if you're an organism like these guys up here that occupies a niche that consists of well, stealing food from other organisms or just finding dead animals, that's a really broad um, spectrum of uh, things to live off of, of, of an um, eating system. Um, so you're going to have a lot of competition within that niche because there's a lot of other organisms that do that. Um, that's a very broad niche. Um, other uh, organisms are going to occupy that niche as well. They're going to be scavengers, so they're going to have to fight with you. You're going to have to fight with them. Lots of competition. Um, so organisms are going to be pushed when there's lots of competitions to go find different niches um, that there's not a lot of competition at. To go find a different environment um, where there's nobody else that you can evolve and adapt to have just for yourself. And that's what makes these really odd species um, that are really specialized and things like that, that are like blind cave fish and things um, that can only exist in one little stream um, with sp uh, very specific water conditions and things like that um, because competition drives them away and they have to find places that are just for them. So if you can reduce this concept of competition by moving away, um, evolving to, to a, a fit a different environment and things like that, um, it's a net gain for you and a net gain for the other species as well because they're not going to have to compete for their food either. Um, so evolving away from these shared niches and things um, is a good thing. Now these exist and these will continue to exist because there is enough food um, to sustain these types of interactions. The competition, the loss of one jackal here and there um, is offset by the fact that the remaining uh, majority of the jackals um, is going to be fed and happy. There's enough food to go around. And now if competition uh, increases because the food goes down, um, this will drive evolution into a different way where jackals might start hunting on the vultures, the vultures might start preying on the jackals and things like that. Um, different types of evolutionary pressures will put different 
um, evolutionary outcomes on them. So, how do these things work? Why does this competition exist? Why do, don't organisms just come to the uh, conclusion of, I'll do you, you do me, we'll both be happy, um, I'll eat a little bit of this, you eat a little bit of this, why don't we just both do our thing, get along? Well, animals can't think um, in the sense that you and I can. They can't make that decision. We can't make decisions like that. We can't come to the conclusions of how to get along and let people live and let live. Um, so animals that are capable of even less conscious thought that are totally driven by instinct um, are less, even less capable of doing that. So when it comes, to, well, they don't, they don't do that. They're not capable of it at all. Well, anyway, um, when it comes to competition in animals, the uh, uh, thing that's used to explain how animals work um, is the competition or competitive exclusion principle. I mean, this is the idea that one animal is always going to be better um, than another animal at doing something in the same environment. Um, now, if you and I live in the same environment, one of us is going to be better at getting food than the other one. That's just kind of the basic fact of life. One species is always going to be better than another species um, that occupies the same area. So you can see down here, our little niche um, is going to be represented by here uh, the side of a mountain cliff. And our species are barnacles, two different species of barnacles, the blue barnacles and the brown barnacles, Catalamus and Balanus. So um, these guys, barnacles, they like to stay underwater the majority of the day. They're filter feeders. Um, staying out of the water is going to expose you to sunlight. You're not going to be able to eat as long. Um, you might die uh, because of dehydration or dry out because of the sun. Um, so you want to spend the majority of your time underwater as a barnacle. Now, both of these barnacle species occupy the same niche, um, niche being that in little tiny microhabitat. The microhabitat um, is going to be the same environment, same water conditions and things like that, um, same little mountain cliff. Well, anyway, um, tide levels uh, go up and down um, throughout the day in the ocean. Um, and this is no different in this little example as well. Well, as low tide goes up to high tide, um, it's going to peak um, right around here um, for the most of the day. It's going to spend the majority of the time um, right here. And you can see this is the kind of the right around the middle of the high tide line. So it will continue to go up until high tide. Um, then it will recede down to this level um, and then recede back down to low tide. So these two organisms... Um, if you would put them um, in the environment, if they had equal dispersion, 50-50, um, they would be dispersed equal from top to bottom, brown all the way through, and, and blue all the way through, mixed around. Well, it turns out that these blue uh, barnacles grow significantly faster than the brown Catalamus barnacles. And the reason that they do that is because they're a little better um, at being able to collect oxygen from the water. They're a little less likely to dry out. They're a little better at filter feeding which means that they reproduce quicker. Now they reproduce quicker, which means that they're able to get um, their babies to the better space along this rock uh, faster than the brown barnacles are. The brown barnacles don't grow as fast, they don't reproduce as quickly. Um, so the blue barnacles are able to grow and spread out across the good space of this rock. Now that leaves the brown barnacles um, that reproduce slowly, they, they don't reproduce as quickly, um, with the brown part of the rock that is exposed to the sunlight the majority of the day. Um, they only get water that they can filter feed with for a couple of hours of the day, whereas the blue barnacles get the majority of the day that they're exposed to water. Um, and eventually what will happen um, is because this little blue barnacle is a little better, just ever so slightly better, um, at living in this niche than the brown barnacle, that this blue barnacle will eventually push this brown barnacle out. Um, and the brown barnacle will either go extinct or evolve in a new niche or evolve in some different way um, that it can survive um, with the balanus uh, barnacle around. Um, it will be forced to either go extinct um, or evolve and adapt to change um, to fit this niche better. So this is the competitive exclusion principle, and this is what kind of drives evolution um, within communities. One organism and species is always better than the other one, no matter what, um, one of them will always be slightly better um, at getting resources from that environment than the other, um, eventually leading to that one organism taking completely over that environment, forcing the other one out, which either leaves the other one to evolve or die. Now, how do we reduce competition? Um, in some places, like forest, um, especially throughout the uh, um, subarctic, 
um, in Arctic regions of Canada and, and places like that, um, there's only so much food to go around in the sense of uh, variety. There's about a three or four species of trees, and they pretty much make up the entire hundreds of thousands of acres of Canadian wilderness to that far north. Um, so you either have to share what you have with every, all the other species that are around you, or you constantly spend all day long fighting, um, comp competing with one another, um, really risking getting damaged, spending your energy um, fighting instead of reproducing, um, and living being healthy and, and successful as a species. So how do pe organisms um, reduce this infighting um, when resources aren't limited? How do uh, organisms evolve to coexist um, within a very similar niche or the same niche? So in this case, um, birds are a really good way to look at this. Um, these are warblers. They're migratory species of birds. They're very small, about the size of a little tiny finch. Um, they come through Tennessee fairly often. Um, early in the spring and late in the fall, they'll come through. Um, and you can see them for a couple of months. Um, anyway, they migrate from uh, northern Canada all the way down to South America. Um, and they stop here along the way. And some of them go all the way to South America. And they kind of stay uh, somewhere along the way. Um, they'll stop and nest off. Uh, some of them go to South America, some of them stay here. It just kind of depends on how far they want to go down. Well, anyway, um, all uh, when they go back up north to Canada, um, they f live in the Arctic and subarctic areas up there in northern Canada, um, and there's not a lot of food up there for these guys. So how do they live together, all these different species of uh, or warblers, um, of birds without fighting with one another? This is a concept called resource partitioning. Um, and this is how different species can share the same resources and reduce uh, competition and infighting between the species. So you see here we have a tree, um, and I talked about this concept earlier. Within that tree, there are different environments, different little micro niches um, within this uh, tree. And we have here a Cape May warbler. Um, and this organism, this species of birds, likes to live up at the top of the tree, um, and it eats the new needles and the buds that live at the very top of the tree. Nobody else, none of these other bird species, do that. Now, they can live in the rest of the tree, and that's fine, because they won't be competing for this guy's food. He lives up at the top and eats the new needles. This black Bernian warbler over here eats some of the new needles, but he also and buds um, of the upper branches. So he lives a little farther down. He'll go up to the top, but not enough to compete with this guy. And he kind of lives in the more of the right around in here area. Um, so there's enough uh, uh, space for him for and this guy to both live together um, and not fight as much and compete with one another for those resources. We have our black-throated green warbler over here, and he lives kind of in the middle of the tree, and he eats older needles and not just the new needles. So that gives him a little extra that he can eat as well. Um, down here we have our bay-breasted warbler, and he eats lichen um, as well as the older needles um, from the middle of the tree near the trunk. <clears throat> and you can see here our yellow rumped warbler that lives on the bottom of the tree um, and also eats lichen um, as well. So five different species of birds can live together within the same tree um, and not compete with one another for the same resources because they've evolved um, to eat different things in that same little um, environment. And this is exactly what evolution does. Um, at one point in time, all of these birds probably ate the exact same thing in the tree. Um, this little guy got tired of having to compete with everybody and was pushed to a different little micro niche within that tree. Um, a couple of the other birds that were around did, ended up having to be pushed away as well. Um, and they ended up reproducing with one another. Um, and over time, they evolved um, to be able to uh, specialize to live in the middle of that tree, becoming a separate species over a couple hundred thousand generations. Um, and that happened with these different species of birds to reduce competition, um, to allow these birds to coexist together um, when resources are limited. And this is called resource partitioning. <clears throat> Sometimes animals... Um, within communities will live together, um, and sometimes they actually will work together as different species. Um, sometimes these interactions can benefit both organisms, um, or else they wouldn't exist. Evolution usually does not keep things around unless there's a reason for it. Um, it either doesn't hurt or, or it helps, and that's kind of how it works. It either can't hurt, um, if it hurt it would go away, or it either has to benefit, and that's the two types of things that evolution keeps around. It either doesn't do anything, so there's no reason to get rid of it, um, or it helps. So that's why these types of uh, um, seemingly strange relationships will evolve.
Let's talk about the different interactions of species. They're really easy to understand and you're probably familiar um, with most of them. So mutualism. Mutualistic relationships between different species evolve when both of the species benefit. Um, now, it seems strange here um, for an alligator to open his mouth and let this little bird hop inside um, and start uh, just chilling inside of his mouth. This alligator could easily just close his mouth um, and get a free meal with this bird. And this bird would uh, seemingly know better than to hop in the mouth of an alligator. So why does this evolutionarily exist? Well, this alligator has little tiny pieces of meat and other prey items stuck inside of his teeth um, that can cause abscesses in his teeth um, and pro dental problems that could eventually lead to his death. Now, what he's doing here is he's opening up his mouth and this bird um, is going to hop inside and walk around inside of that alligator's mouth and pick the meat and uh, other little food particles um, from around that alligator's teeth. He's kind of a dentist and clean up um, the alligator's teeth for him. So this alligator has evolved to uh, allow this bird to do this because it's beneficial, because um, if he didn't, he would have serious dental problems. And this bird has evolved to do this because he gets a free meal. Um, there's no risk to him because the alligator is getting a, a benefit as well. They, both of these species benefit, which is why this evolutionary relationship still continues. Um, it would be very easy to eat this bird as free meal. Any other bird that hops inside of this alligator's mouth, he would eat. Um, it's just this one species that knows... Um, that he can get away with doing this because they've co-evolved um, with one another to do this type of relationship. Um, once again, this evolves because it's very easy to get a, a, a to go. Oh, I can get a free meal by myself if I go help this alligator out. Um, it's uh, I know that this alligator is always going to have food. All the alligators are going to have food in their mouth stuck there throughout their all their lives. Um, if anytime I walk up to an alligator, I can get free food. Um, if I know the alligator is not going to eat me, and the alligator knows that anytime this little bird species walks up to him, he's not going to eat him, he's going to get his teeth cleaned, and this bird's not going to hurt him. Um, so these evolutionary uh, types of relationships exist because of the, uh, those benefits to each other. Up here we have a clownfish and a sea anemone. Um, clownfish live inside of the sea anemone. The sea anemone uh, allow the clownfish to live inside of them as well. Well, the clownfish cleans the sea anemone. Um, he cleans out the debris and uh, food particles and things that are left behind the sea anemone. And the sea anemone protects the clownfish um, from getting uh, eaten um, because the sea anemone is uh, toxic and stings and things kind of like a jellyfish. Now, the clownfish themselves are uh, originally stung by the conf uh, sea anemone. When the clownfish moves into the sea anemone at the very beginning of their relationship, when the clownfish uh, leaves the uh, original nest and moves into his own sea anemone, it takes about a week or so of the clownfish getting stung constantly um, for the clownfish to become immune to the uh, sea anemone's venom and then develop a slime coating that keeps him from getting stung. Um, and if he moves to a new sea anemone, it will sting him as well um, until he develops the immunity to that. So they do get stung. Um, they just eventually have to develop a, that immunity for it. Um, but that's why these they uh, evolve, because the clownfish could just easily uh, be, you know, just go find somewhere else to, to live, but he gets protection inside of the sea anemone, and the sea anemone um, likes to have itself cleaned because they don't have hands and things that they can clean themselves with. And then down here, the most obvious one is I'm going to provide you with a, a, a nice food source of nectar as a butterfly. Um, if you, as the butterfly, agree to carry around my pollen um, from place to place. So very easy um, relationship down here. So mutualism, both of these partners are going to be benefited in this type of evolutionary relationship, um, which is why it persists, because there's a benefit to it. Now, commensalism. Once again, evolution works on the concept of as long as it's not hurting you, there's no reason to get rid of it. Um, and this is commensalism here. This is not harming any of these organisms, this type of relationship. One species is benefited while the other one has no negative impact on it whatsoever. Um, you can see down here, oops, sorry, we have our horse with the little uh, cattle egrets following him around. This horse, this may be irritating from time to time, but it's not a big enough deal um, for this horse to die or to be seriously damaged or to have any sort of consequence to its uh, reproductive or evolutionary health. Um, so it's not any real reason for this horse to evolve to get rid of these um, egrets, to, to run them away, um, to try to kill them or things like that. Now the egrets are following around the horse because the horse kicks up um, bugs um, and things throughout the day as he walks around. So they'll follow him around and go through his dung and pick out uh, 
pieces of uh, food and things undigested, seeds and things that the horse has eaten, um, follow him around and pick up the uh, um, bugs that he kicks up, eat the bugs that try to live on the horse and on the feces and things. Um, and that's why these egrets follow the horse around all day long. They all, they will do this with cows. They'll do this with any animal um, that's even similar to a cow or horse or things like that. They do this with a wildebeest, anything like that they'll follow around. Um, and there's no real pressure for the other organisms to get rid of them because it doesn't hurt them at all. It's just kind of maybe at the most a little irritating when they stand on them. Um, the birds get a plus from following around the uh, other animals, but the other animals aren't harmed. Up here we have our barnacles living on a whale. Um, the whale is not harmed by having the barnacles live on his face at all. It doesn't cause him a bit of pain. They're just kind of unsightly. Um, but the barnacles get a free ride around the ocean. They're always pretty much under the water. Um, and this whale is going to actively seek out food. Um, so you can just filter feed any of the food that he eats. Um, instead of just having to hope that the water that you're in, um, and if you're attached to a rock or something, um, is going to have enough food in there for you or that the water doesn't dry out and you die. Um, so this is a little uh, why this type of relationship evolves. And then down here we have our remora fish on the shark. The shark is not harmed. Um, the remora fish don't do anything. They just kind of suction cup to his side. Um, but when he kills a fish, um, they get to go out and get the little scraps that are left over. Sharks make messes when they eat. Um, and the remoras get a free ride around the ocean um, stuck to the shark. They don't have to swim. Um, so the shark's not harmed with having these remora fish stuck to him. Um, and the remora fish get a free ride um, and food. So no negative pressure to uh, for the shark to kill the remora fish. They're not hurting him. No evolutionary professor, uh, pressure for the uh, barnacles to go away. They're not hurting the whale. Um, so that's once why these commensalistic types of relationships exist. There's no harm. And then we have parasitism. And this is where one species benefits while the other species is negatively impacted. And this is the other type of evolution. One species wins, which is the kind of the whole point. This is the competitive exclusion principle. If I can win more than you, um, I'm going to win and you're going to lose. That's kind of how parasitism works. And these types of relationships exist because one animal is better at winning than the other ones. Um, so parasitism is the uh, um, use of one animal actively preying upon the uh, another species for its own benefit. Um, now, parasites come in all different shapes and forms. Um, you're probably familiar with things like tapeworms, things like malaria parasites, and things as a um, things like parasites as a mosquito that feed upon you and things like that. Um, the tapeworm gets a free meal from your digestive tract. He lives inside of you. Um, you, on the other hand, lose about 30 to 40 percent of any nutrients that you eat, and they could potentially kill you. You get no positive impact whatsoever. It's all negative. Where that tapeworm gets a free meal. Down here, you might get malaria, you might die. Um, if the most, it's going to be a little itchy and irritating, which is not good. Um, you could be allergic to mosquito bites and things like that. You could get West Nile. Um, but the mosquito is going to get a nice blood meal, and he's going to be a happy, fat mosquito. Um, so that's a positive for him and a negative for you. Um, so that's parasitism. Um, and then there's parasitism in different forms, things like brood parasitism. Bird species do this. Ducks do this a lot. Um, but one of the very common species of birds that's around Tennessee that does this is something called a brown-headed cowbird. And this is a little baby brown-headed cowbird here. Um, the females look similar to that. The males are very dark black, um, very shimmery black with a light brownish kind of, a, um, kind of a, that, that color right here, head. Um, so that's how you, you can identify that species, and they're about the size of maybe a uh, maybe about a eh, about a, about a cardinal. Um, well, anyway, um, those birds, what they do is they lay their nest, their eggs in other species' nest. Um, so this is a cowbird egg here, and these are the uh, original birds' eggs that were laid in this nest. And the cowbird will follow around um, the little mother songbird, cardinal, or whatever it happens to be all day, watch the mother lay her eggs, and then within about a day or two after the mother uh, bird lays her eggs, the little mother cowbird will sneak in while the mother bird's going out to feed, lay her egg, um, sneak away, and then never, ever, ever have anything to do with that baby again. Now what they will do is sit around and watch the nest to make sure that the mother bird, um, the original mother bird, uh, accepts this egg. So the original mother bird will come back. Um, they probably won't notice anything's wrong here. They'll sit down and start incubating all the babies. Um, all the babies will hatch. Um, this guy hatches about a day early. He gets a little extra food, um, gets a little jump start, and he sits there with his mouth open all day long screaming for food. 
Um, so this little mother bird's going to spend all of her day going out searching for um, food to feed the baby cowbird and not her own babies because this guy screams for food more often than her babies. Um, so the cowbird's going to out-eat the little baby birds of her own species. These guys will probably starve to death, um, or instead of being able to successfully raise all five, she might only be able to find enough food for two of them um, and the cowbird baby um, because she has to feed that cowbird baby so much because they grow so fast and they demand so much food. Now, the mother bird has no earthly idea that that's not her own baby, um, and eventually what will happen is the babies will leave the nest, um, and that cowbird will go out and do the exact same thing once it's ready to start reproducing. Um, no cowbird has ever been, that exists today excuse me, um, has ever been raised by its own parents. They just don't do that. Um, and this is a concept called brood parasitism. Now, some species of birds have evolved to be able to see this cowbird egg, um, and they will kick it out of their nest. Um, or they will abandon the nest completely. Um, other species of birds make five or six nests, and they lay five or six fake eggs, quote-unquote. They're not fertilized. That they, uh, birds control that can control their fertilization. Um, they can uh, uh, become uh, pregnant whenever they want to. They just have to um, have sperm present, um, and then they can be control when their eggs become fertile or not. Um, so they can lay five or six fake eggs in five or six fake nests, um, and then the cowbirds will get confused on which nest is real, um, and then the uh, uh, mother bird will have a, a more likely chance of having a, a successful nest like that. Other birds will build nests with fake nests on top, um, kind of a, a two-story nest with a fake nest on top that the cowbirds can lay in, and their nest is kind of underneath it. Very interesting how birds have evolved to get around this concept. So this is brood parasitism, so different forms of parasitism, um, but one species always benefits the the. Uh, cowbird gets a free baby, um, whereas the other species is negatively impacted um, because her babies are going to be killed, um, and she's going to have to spend most of her energy feeding him instead of uh, her babies. So let's go ahead and start talking about a little bit about um, ecosystems um, and go ahead and finish up our communities here. So our communities will finish up with the predator and prey relationship. Um, predator and prey relationships are always considered a constant arms race um, on the evolutionary spectrum. One species is always trying to get better um, than the other one um, because the zebra doesn't want to get eaten, so he's always going to get try to get faster to be able to blend in better, um, to be able to kick harder than the lion. Um, and the lion is going to always try to evolve to be faster, um, stronger, to jump farther, um, and be faster and overall better um, than the zebra. So one of these species is always going to be in constant evolution to try to get better um, better than one or the other species are, that are trying to eat them um, because they don't want to die. So the uh, evolutionary arms race. I'm going to try to get faster than you, so you're going to have to get faster to catch me, which is going to have to drive me to get faster so you can't catch me, um, and so on and so forth. Um, and you can see this in every pr uh, species pretty much around the globe. Um, species evolve to become white in the winter um, and brown in the summer, and their predators do the exact same thing, so they blend in. Um, so predator-prey relationships are uh, an arms race in this one. Now, why doesn't this stuff just spiral out of control? Why don't we have zebras that run at 8 million miles an hour and lions that can do the exact same thing? Why don't we have invisible uh, bunnies and things like that? Well, um, you have to realize we also live in the real world here. Um, there are limitations to physics. Um, bones can only get so thick um, or else they're going to get so heavy um, that they cannot move successfully, um, or they're going to be so thick that they won't be able to have bone marrow inside of them if you have solid bones. So you have to bo have a bone that's functional, so it can only be so thick, which means it can only be so strong, which means you can only run so fast, um, or else you're going to have to have stronger bones, or they'll shatter with the amount of pressure that you would put underneath it running at like 800 miles an hour or something silly like that. Muscles can only get so big as well. Tendons can only get so strong. It's kind of like wood or the building materials that we have. Um, we can't make wood stronger. Um, you can only uh, Evolution can only work with what it has. It has biological muscle, biological bone, biological tendon, and that stuff can only get so strong. So animals can only get so fast, it can jump so high, um, and things like that, because they are limited 
um, in the physical makeup of their bodies. Um, you can't make a bone stronger um, without losing um, some sort of trade-off to that, losing the amount of bone marrow, um, losing weight is going to be heavier if it's stronger, which means you're going to be slowed down because you have more weight. So there are trade-offs to every single one of those. Um, and that's why animals evolve the way they do. They are limited in how they can evolve because physics um, of their biological bodies um, put uh, limitations on how evolution um, can do things. So coevolution. Um, is one organism evolving to specialize and essentially rely on another organism um, within that ecosystem or that niche that it lives in to up until the point that they are so specialized that if one species dies, the other one will go extinct. Um, one of them goes extinct, the other one will go extinct as well. Now, these types of relationships tend to evolve um, on islands where there are not a lot of organisms to um, uh, to deal with. Um, if you're a flowering plant that needs something to pollinate your um, uh, flower with, and there's only one thing to do it with, there's only one bird on the island that could pollinate things, there's no be bugs or beetles or bees and things like that, you're going to have to evolve to com accommodate that bird or else you're going to go extinct. And if you're a bird and there's only one uh, flower to eat, you're going to have to evolve to eat with that flower or else you're going to go extinct kind of thing. Or these things tend to evolve in the tropics, where there is a ton of competition. If I can evolve to have one species that fertilizes my uh, uh, flower, um, I have an exclusive um, fertilizer, whereas all the rest of the 8 billion flowers around me have to deal with sharing pollinators kind of thing. Um, so this is coevolution. So what is it? One species evolves um, to totally depend on the other one and they're both totally independent on the other. They evolve side by side. So you can see here um, a honey creeper, and this bird's beak fits perfectly down into the shape of this flower. Um, its tongue, you can see its tongue down there, will go down and lick out the nectar on the bottom of this flower. Um, this is the only organism on the planet that is capable of getting the nectar from this flower. It's also the only organism that fertilizes this flower when the bird sticks his head down in there. Um, the little flower, stamens up here, will get pollen all over the top of his head. And when he flies to the next flower to drink some nectar out of there, he unknowingly carries the pollen with him and pollinates the next flower. This happens a lot with flowers and things like that. You can see a hawk moth up here. His proboscis is so long, it's the only thing able to get down um, and then get the nectar out of that flower, um, getting the pollen on his beak uh, or on his, uh, his head. Same thing over here for our hummingbird. It's flower is so long that his beak's the only thing that's long enough to do this. So why do these types of relationships evolve? Well, um, for the flower, uh, he has uh, food that he provides for this bird. This bird knows that every time he sees one of these flowers, he has an exclusive source of food for him. He's the only thing that can get it. He knows wherever this flower is, he can go find food, guaranteed food. The flower also knows that by providing guaranteed food, he gets a free service of pollinating his flowers. They don't know this, keep that in mind. It's, I'm using these terms because it's easy to understand. This is just evolutionary pressures. There's no conscious decision making in this. Um, this is just how evolution works. It just kind of does. But I, I use I had to kind of humanize this a little bit because it's easier to understand. But anyway, um, same thing over here. Um, this sword bill hummingbird. Um, his beak is so long. He's the only species that can go up in here. Um, so this flower, by providing a meal for this one species of bird only, um, is guaranteeing that he has a pollinator for him. So they both get something here. But the downside of this is if this bird species here dies, this flower has nothing to pollinate him. If this bird species goes extinct, the flower is gone. If the uh, hummingbird goes extinct, its flower is going to go extinct as well because nothing else can pollinate it. So there are dangers on relying on one species and one species alone um, as, a, as a relationship like that, co-evolutionary relationship. So now let's go ahead and talk a little bit about um, in the uh, ecosystem concept. How do we build ecosystems from communities? Um, how do you, we go from things like bare rock, just land um, that's created out of the ocean and things like that through volcanic eruptions? Um, the, you probably have seen the islands of Hawaii getting uh, the uh, lava boiling into the ocean. Um, it hardens and builds up over thousands and millions of years, building a little island. Um, or an earthquake exposes a brand new piece of land that's never had anything living on it, just uh, bare fresh rock, uh, landslide, and things like that. How do we go from brand new land to having organisms living on them? 
Now, this is the concept uh, of species secession. So how does this work? Well, we're going to have, at the beginning of time, um, bare rock, whenever this new ecosystem is exposed. No organisms have ever lived here. Now, bare rock itself um, has no real nutrients in it. Nothing's going to be able to live here very well. Um, but as rain falls on this, as the wind erodes it, um, as sunlight weakens the rock itself, it will eventually start um, to break down into small, little, tiny, sandy particles kind of thing. Just small little pieces of rock over time are going to be broken off and eroded away. Now, eventually what will happen is little tiny seeds and spores and things from plants, um, small little lichen-like species, maybe some small little mosses and things like that, um, will start to grow on the surface of these rocks. There's not a lot of moisture here. These plants are very good at surviving in arid, dry environments with a lot of sunlight in them. So that's why these are the first species that are going to show up in this environment. These are called pioneer species, the uh, very hardy species that are good at living in very, very um, lacking environments. Now, once these lichens start to show up, um, their tiny little hyphae-like root little systems, their rhizoid-like roots, um, are going to start growing into the rock, um, which is going to increase the rate of erosion as they break away little pieces as they grow and things like that. Um, now, as these pieces erode and break away, and as the lichen starts to die and decay, and more lichen grows and dies and decays and builds up over time, its little bodies and things um, decay, um, it's going to start to build little amounts of dirt, little small amounts of soil, um, organic matter, little tiny pieces of rock, decayed uh, ground up lichen matter for over time, um, and eventually that's going to build up and build up and build up over hundreds of years um, until the little tiny small seeds and things, maybe a bird flying over drops some seeds in its feces, or the wind blew some seeds in, maybe a bird, a bug, I mean, things like that drops some seeds in. Um, and then those little tiny seeds are going to start to have enough soil to be able to establish their roots and grow. Now once that starts, the uh, plants are going to start to grow, then die, um, and their bodies are going to start being added to the soil layer and decaying, adding more and more nutrients to the plants and to the soil and things like that. Um, Erosion is going to start to increase as the plant roots grow. Um, and as the amount of soil increases, the amount of plants, then ta the taller the plants can start to grow um, and things like that. So as we continue on, um, you will start to see intermediate species, species that are a little uh, more adapt at surviving, but not as good um, as able to survive in bare rock um, in very little soil, like these lichens and small plants and things. Intermediate species can survive in a, um, shade tolerant. They can survive a little bit of the shade because there are some taller trees that cast some shadows and things like that. Um, they need a little more soil, but not quite as much soil as something like a 500-foot oak tree or something like that. Um, and then over a couple more hundreds of years, um, you get to the very end of this uh, primary species secession march um, called a climax community. I mean, this is when you have what you would expect to see um, in every ecosystem around it um, in this area, a very similar, similar ecosystem. Um, you would see the very tall oak trees, the long-lived trees that put cast shade on the bottom um, of the environment. You would see a healthy cover with the brush underneath. Um, and things like that. You would see a very healthy, uh, functioning, uh, climax community here. And this is kind of the end game. This takes hundreds of years to go from bare rock through the process of erosion, um, little small plants moving in, um, to build up to our climax community. And then all of a sudden, our climax community has a problem. There is a fire. Um, a natural disaster wipes it out, a lightning strike, um, and it all burns to the ground. Well, Secondary species secession is a very simple process and occurs significantly quicker um, than primary species secession. So instead of starting with bare rock here, we start out with a lot of soil and not a lot growing on it. Well, that soil has just had a lot of nitrogen and nutrients added to it um, very quickly and very easily. Um, the little seeds and things can start to rejuvenate, um, build up another layer of soil and things on top of that burned a layer of ground underneath it. Um, and then very quickly, um, it can rebuild that climax community. Um, since it was it already had it, it's not hard to rebuild it. Um, it's only really hard to build it um, without having it from the get-go. So in less than about 150, 200 years or so, you can rebuild a climax community from a, a secondary secession event to a fire or something like that. But it takes hundreds or thousands of years um, to start 
from bare rock to eventually end up with a climax community. And this is how ecosystems work. Okay, So you can measure um, an environment, an ecosystem, to determine how healthy they are. Um, in the sense of how many animals are there, how many different species are there, and things like that. Um, and the way that you're going to look at that and what you're going to look at is something called habitat diversity. Um, and there's two different factors that you're going to look at when you're looking at how healthy an environment is. Um, something called species richness, which are how many different species are going to be found in that environment, and species evenness, which is the proportion of one species to another. Now this is species richness and species evenness. So species, species richness. Species richness is going to be the number of different species that occupy the same area. So over here you can see we have community one and community two. There are four different species within this community. One, two, three, four, A, B, C, D, A, B, C, D. By the level of species richness, these both uh, communities are both equally rich in the same amount of species. There are four species in each community. Now if you look at it, the species evenness of this particular community is vastly skewed to um, species A than the rest of them. Over here we have a very equal um, species um, evenness. Over here we don't. So over here, this is species evenness on that same kind of example. You have a very low species evenness. You have four species, so the species richness is the same. Over here, you have a more equal species evenness. They are equally dis uh, dispute, uh, distributed throughout the environment. You have the same amount of population in each one. So species richness looks at how many different species you have. Species evenness looks at the percentages of each one to another. Species richness, um, if you have a lot of diverse species within your environment, that's a good thing. You want a healthy environment that div uh, supports a diverse amount of species, that um, supports um, a large amount of life, that has a well-balanced ecosystem in it. Now, species evenness. Um, species richness is kind of, uh, kind of misleading. Um, four species, yeah, there are four species over here in community too, but by using species evenness, we know that species A contains about 80%, which can tell you that maybe there's a soil problem here. These other two species, or three species of plants, don't like acidic soil. Maybe species A does. Um, maybe there's been a natural leak of some sort of chemical or something that happened to this soil um, that makes community our plant A um, grow in a significantly higher number in this ecosystem when compared to the ecosystem next to it. Um, so let's figure out what the problem here is. So species evenness and species richness um, are good ways to look at how healthy populations, um, communities, and ecosystems are. So um, another way that interactions between communities and the ecosystems take place um, is by looking at food webs and interactions between how organisms eat. Um, so at the bottom, you have things called producers, and these are plants, organisms that take sunlight um, and convert it into usable chemical energy. Then you're going to have primary consumers that sit right above that, um, and primary consumers are going to be very numerous. They are going to be specialized in large amounts of small niches across the environment, um, eating little tiny pieces of plants, eating the bugs that live in the plants, um, eating the plants themselves, eating different species of plants, living in the plants, eating their nectar, um, eating things that live in the plants, eating their seeds, um, and things like that. But you're going to have a significant number of primary consumers um, then you look at things called secondary consumers. And secondary consumers eat the primary consumers. And you have to have less secondary consumers than primary consumers and less primary consumers than producers or else the um, number of primary consumers would go down because there'd be more secondary consumers to eat them before they could reproduce. Um, so you have to have a nice little balanced triangle or else uh, one of them is going to collapse. Same thing all the way up. Uh, tertiary consumers consume secondary consumers who consume primary consumers who consume producers for their energy and quaternary consumers so on and so forth all the way down um, you can only have so many quaternary consumers because if you add more of them they're going to out consume the tertiary consumers before they can reproduce which is going to cause a problem with the secondary consumers exploding because there's not anybody to eat them which is going to cause the primary consumers to collapse and so on and so forth which causes eventually these guys are not of food these guys are not of food and then these guys are not of food which causes the whole thing to collapse um, so very 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 intricately um, delicate intricately balanced um, thing here so every time an organism eats um, and it's transferred its, its energy one level up the food uh, trophic levels here, the trophic uh, sphere, the food web. Um, heat is lost 
um, and in that process. Um, it takes energy to make energy. Um, you're going to lose heat. You're not going to get 100% of the energy every single time um, from the organism that you eat. If you did, you could have an equal number of consumers as to producers, but you don't. And the reason that you have that difference there, or that difference the re that it exists, the fact that it exists, it takes energy to make energy, um, you lose a lot of energy through the powering of that organism just by its day-to-day -day living, which is why you don't get it back when you eat them. Um, explains why that there's less um, of each one of the levels of consumers, um, because they just don't get as much energy. I mean, if they got the equal amount of energy each single time, um, there could be equal amounts of consumers, uh, secondary consumers, and tertiary consumers um, compared, compared to the primary producers, but they don't, um, and that's why. So um, within ecosystems um, and communities, we often have something called a keystone species, and the keystone species um, is an organism that if it goes away, the entire ecosystem will collapse. Um, they can be there within very small numbers, usually they are, um, but they're very, very, very important for the entire ecosystem to be healthy. Um, and if this uh, keystone, keystone species is removed, the entire ecosystem can collapse, um, and sometimes they can never re uh, rebound um, and be healthy again. So in this example, um, we're using sea otters. So California sea otters and Pacific Coast sea otters live up and down the coast of the Pacific Ocean, um, usually in northern California and things like that, where there's giant kelp forest and things like that. Now, in the 1900s, uh, late 1800s, early 1900s, um, it became very fashionable for otter skin hats to become a thing. So hunters went by the hundreds of thousands to California and killed pretty much every otter they could see um, and turned them into hats. Now, what they didn't know was that otters um, were very, very, very important, uh, considered a keystone species for the kelp forest um, that sit off the, fort, off the shores of California in the Pacific Ocean. Now, these large kelp forests with these um, 50, 60 foot long uh, strands of kelp that are attached to the forest bed um, contain um, lots and lots and lots of diverse uh, species of life that live within them. Large species of fish uh, live within them, big giant um, grouper and things like that love to lurk around in here. Um, these um, uh, uh, giant kelp forests um, will attract large schools of small fish. Um, that find safety in these big kelp forests. Uh, other fish species breed here and things like that. Now, when that happens, um, all these fish are going to attract in seals and things like that, um, and dolphins to prey upon those fish, sharks to prey upon those fish, um, which is going to attract in things that prey upon uh, seals and things like larger species of sharks and killer whales. I um, mean, out in the forest, since we are out in the deeper ocean, since we're going to have a very functional, um, productive, nutrient rich environment here with all of this kelp, um, it's going to cause populations of uh, um, krill I and mean, little brine shrimp and things like that to explode off the shores, which is going to draw in whales. Um, so this kelp forest uh, provides a lot of nutrients I and mean, is a very, very, very important environment um, for uh, lots of species, um, even off the coast of California. So back around to our otters here. Sea urchins live inside of this kelp forest, and one of their favorite things to eat are kelp forest. They will go up the stalks of the kelp. You can see them back here. Um, they've gone up the stalks of the kelp and eaten all the leaves. This is a long just uh, stalk of kelp with no leaves on it. This eventually will cause the kelp to die, and as the sea urchins eat the leaves, the kelp die, um, the kelp go away, the sea urchins just explode in numbers. So, um, with the otters are over hunted, this is exactly what happened. The sea otters, when they're present, they love to eat the sea urchins. So when sea otters are present in large numbers, they will eat the sea urchins like crazy. Um, they will keep the sea urchin numbers uh, populations in check because that's one of their favorite foods. Now, when we hunted these poor guys almost to extinction, um, the sea urchins were able to reproduce like crazy. Nothing was there to eat them. They started to eat these kelp forests and destroy them. Um, eventually, the kelp forest went away, which caused the fish that bred within those kelp forests to go away, which caused the seals to go away, which caused the sharks and dolphins to go away, which caused the whales to go away. So the entire population collapsed simply because these otters were removed. Now, people figured this out um, in about the 50s or so before it was too late, and they started reintroducing the otters to California. 
And once they reintroduced the otters, the otters started preying again upon the uh, sea urchins, and the kelp forest recovered. I and mean, once the kelp forest recovered, um, the animals started to return to their natural ecosystems. Um, a couple of other examples of keystone species are wolves. Um, wolves are very important for their environment. They prey on the weak um, and the slow animals. Um, they also prey on coyotes and things um, that prey on other animals as well. Um, so when the wolves are removed from an ecosystem, this happens in Yellowstone, um, the elk population, the deer population gets extremely unhealthy because the weak animals are allowed to reproduce, um, whereas they would normally be eaten um, and things like that. So wolves are very, very important um, for maintaining the health um, of animal populations. So without the wolves, the coyotes can also reproduce like crazy, um, which is, causes them to start overly preying on um, other animals like deer and things um, that they normally wouldn't prey on. Uh, so that's an interesting concept of how keystone species works. Um, the concept of coevolution here um, that we talked about earlier, these are all keystone species. Without one or the other, they will both go extinct. So in this concept, they're both considered keystone species. Okay, onward. So the water cycle, um, you've probably gone over this 100 million times. This is in the environment, how water goes from the ocean back up to the atmosphere. It condenses in the clouds and is rained back down eventually making its way all back to the ocean. The carbon cycle, same thing, recycling of uh, atmospheric carbon um, into solid carbons and trees and things like that. We burn it or release it back into the carbon, uh, release it back into the atmosphere via burning carbon fuels or bur uh, burning uh, organic matter and things like that. Um, and then it's released back into the environment where it rains back down um, in the sense of acid uh, rain, and things like that. Um, it eventually can be stored in the sense of limestone, coal, and gas. These are called carbon sinks from hundreds of millions of years ago. Um, and this is the way that the ecosystem deals with getting rid of carbon. It just sticks it all in one giant spot. Um, and now we're getting into this stuff and releasing it that carbon that's been trapped for hundreds of thousands of years back into the environment. Eventually it's going to have to come back down at some point in time. Nitrogen cycle works the same way. Um, the recycling and movement of nitrogen. Uh, from the environment and back around. Um, eutropification cycles. Um, eutropification is the concept of building up of sediment over time um, in an environment. Um, and this happens all the time through the process of rainwater, um, erosion, and things like that. Water is going to take with it small particles as it erodes over time. Um, and there's two types. There's natural eutropification, where over centuries and uh, hundreds of thousands of years, uh, natural sediments through natural run-ins and the rain and things, natural minerals in the rain, um, can build up and, and decrease the water levels um, in, in rivers and things like that. Or humans can cause it, where we can wash in those natural uh, sediments and things like that into a, an ecosystem. Now, when this happens, when the water level is reduced or more, in, uh, uh, more environmental nutrients are introduced, um, when this water level is introduced, more sunlight is uh, allowed to get in, more oxygen is, uh, is uh, um, produced by the plants and things like that, causes a nutrient bloom. Um, and when that happens, the uh, top of the plants, the top of the uh, lake, tends to become covered in algae um, and things like that. And that algae chokes out the sunlight, which then chokes out the other life underneath it because they can't get the sunlight. Um, and when that happens, the algae is not going to be able to produce any more uh, oxygen because the sunlight's choked it out. The algae will die. Eventually, the uh, or sorry, the plants will no longer be able to produce any more al uh, oxygen. The plants will die, um, leading to the death of the fish that feed on them. Um, and then the plants and uh, the animals and things that feed on the fish will eventually leave. Um, and this whole little pond here will eventually just turn into a, a stagnant, green, yucky mud hole um, through this process of natural erosion over time called eutrophication. Um, or we can help it too, or help or hurt, I should say. So that's pretty much all I've got for you guys on this lecture um, on how communities interact with one another um, and how they interact with one another in the environment um, and how both of those things can help influence evolution. Um, so if you'd like me to elaborate a little more on any of these points or you just have any questions at all, um, feel free to email me. If not, have a good rest of the day.